Okay, so this is a pretty long-winded introduction to this course, which is to say we've always already done an introduction to the general field and to the, the broader program. We do need to speak just a bit about this course specifically. Uh, and so this will be a mix of a couple bits of biology, but then also um, some practicalities. So the real basics are that at, at the same time we know a lot and we know very little about biodiversity. There's lots of data. Uh, there's not much order to the data, which is to say there's this mix of leaks and non-standard formats and things like that that mean that the usable data will be a very small proportion even of what has been sampled. Um, and I think it's not an exaggeration to say that no major taxon is well documented across the whole world. Um, I think it's not an exaggeration to argue that birds might be the best documented taxon worldwide. But this is a view of digital accessible knowledge of birds as of October 2010. Okay, I'm not going to show you. It gets better. Um, Australia, for example, fills in quite a bit with the appearance of the Atlas of Living Australia. The US actually looks pretty bad in this, and that's because a lot of the big observational data sets, like the Breeding Bird Survey, uh, have not been integrated. So it's that final, final data leak where the data are digital, the data are shared, but they're not integrated into the global whole. Um, so anyhow, this is, this is a map at one degree resolution of the world where you see blue, there's some information, but it's not at all complete. Essentially the inventory of that 100 by 100 kilometer square is not at all done. We'll talk about what that means soon. Um, where you see red, those are areas where the inventory is, at least in quantitative terms, relatively complete. And where you see gray, there is no digital accessible knowledge. Okay? This is what I'm talking about, challenging the birding community to fill in these holes. Um, just so you get a little bit oriented about Kate, whom all of you have met via hundreds of emails, um, these records here in the Southern Oceans are the focus of Kate's doctoral dissertation. Um, those are bird records mainly from uh, ship trawls down towards Antarctica. Um, now we can we can play with this global view, and this is just for terrestrial and marine. Um, and this is a frequency plot going from zero knowledge to very well known. And all I want you to see is that very few pixels on Earth are very well known. In fact, very few pixels are at all well known at the spatial resolution of 100 by 100 kilometers, and that most of the pixels fall into this zero category. Again, that's October 2010. There have been some changes. Um, we're just finishing up this, this global analysis. Um, so a real critical question is how do you fill those gaps? And so that brings us to these, this idea of biodiversity inventories. And as I mentioned earlier, just as one application of this, of this field, if you put together good information about geographic distributions and good information about taxonomy with information over here about human activity, if your only interest is in conservation, you really need those three ingredients or you will end up 
wasting resources and making mistakes and essentially missing the target. So, couldn't resist Mark. Uh, one avenue, and certainly not the only avenue to filling in those gaps, is on the ground, de novo, biodiversity inventories. And I put this up just because it's, it's a map summary of um, all of the expeditions that have been run by the KU Ornithology Group, essentially in the last 21 years since Mark and I moved there. Um, Mark has been the driving force be behind a lot of that, probably three quarters of it. Um, but essentially you can see the activity in the Americas, in Africa, and across East Asia and into Oceania. Um, we've had uh, two other staff colleagues and then a large number of postdocs and students who have participated and in some cases driven some of these efforts. But again, I'll give Mark a lot of the credit. So you guys know this because I think all of you have done at least some field biology, but this is not necessarily you know, sitting and analyzing data. This is a lot of heavy lifting. Um, that's an expedition on its way to China. Um, and you know, there's a lot of logistics. That's in the Peruvian Andes in 2008. Um, and it's, a lot of it is just making things happen. So, you know, sometimes uh, the people who do the, the field inventories are so busy doing this that they don't get credit for the science that they do. And it's a big tension because you may spend a month, two months just, you know, loading trucks and you know, doing these very you know, kind of manual labor type things, but the inventory work, that first link in our, in our digital accessible knowledge chain, that doesn't happen without this kind of work. Um, this was a trip with Rafe in 2006 um, to the northern Philippines, and it was all by, by a very rudimentary fishing boat to get from one island to the next. Um, plant people and herp people here, I will venture to say have it easy as far as specimen preparation. Do we have any objections? Okay. So bird, <laughs> bird uh, work requires specimen preparation that is on the order of a half hour to 45 minutes per specimen when you've been doing it for a long time. And Jacob, for example, has been suffering to, you know, we said, get it under an hour. And it's, it's a huge amount of work. So essentially, in ornithology, we suffer this, this big tax at the beginning, which is that every specimen we prepare takes a huge amount of time. Uh, this is a guy named Max Thompson who's been, a, been associated with ornithology at the University of Kansas for, what, almost 50 years? Um, Mike Anderson, a recent graduate um, from our program preparing specimens in Peru. Um, that's actually dinner and a field camp in China. And for those of you who were hearing the story about the ice cold beer and in camp in China. That's the water pipeline that was bringing the ice cold water into camp. Here's a challenge for you. Whom in this picture do you know? <laughs> wow, I'm still recognizable? <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> that, no. <laughs> yeah, that, that was in 1988 in, um, in Mexico, and that was a six month long, nonstop inventory trip, collecting trip. Um, and that was literally no more than two nights spent at any one place for six months. Uh, but, you know, in the bird world, we have a lot of fun. Um, I think, without a doubt, our animals are much more attractive than. No question. Yeah. 
I mean, do you have any doubts, Mark? Jacob? Kate? Oh, you probably do. Uh, miniature woodpecker in Southeast Asia. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's a little finch in, in Northeast China. But these translate into these seemingly minor publications which essentially document local faunas and local floras. Um, they're certainly not a publication that you want to build your career on because if you go into academia, your department is going to want the synthetic publications. And I would argue that those are in some sense the next step. You do this a lot and then the synthesis is putting together those very basic publications. Um, and then sometimes, this is a, a colleague of, of Dave's at the California Academy of Sciences, his name is Brian Fisher, sometimes you can put together the field work and the collections and you can turn it into some really exciting uh, movement on the conservation front. And so this is, for Madagascar, a data and science-based prioritization of areas for conservation. And essentially, you know, focus on the, the red areas. Those are the areas that need to be added into Madagascar's conservation network to make it substantively more optimal for conservation of Malagasy biodiversity. And that's really exciting because it's based on information, it's based on data. It's not just, oh, I went to this place and it was really pretty, or the forest is incredible there. If it's not ideal for protecting the biodiversity, then don't call it a biodiversity conservation area. Okay, so what we're really after is to give you some basic concepts and perhaps some novel ideas regarding developing inventories of major taxa at single sites. If you're interested in regional inventory, that was the last course which was held in Uganda. All the films are online. You can go and, and see what you think of that course. We will develop on-site inventories of plants, herps, and birds at a very diverse site in Korup National Park. And then more generally, we want to discuss and debate any interesting ideas and all of this content all of these interactions should be captured digitally and shared globally um, just to give you an idea I've mentioned a couple of times this West African plants project that Moses and several others are are involved in that project came out of a discussion and debate at the South Africa course. Four or five people were sitting around the table and somebody said, well, you know, why don't we have data, you know, good, usable, quality controlled data for West African plants? They were a bunch of West Africans sitting around the table, obviously. And the answer was, well, the, you know, this herbarium and this herbarium and this herbarium haven't gotten around to capturing their data. <laughs> 